Okay, so it's 1030 now, and I think at the little past we let some other people join in, and so um, we, we may be able to do this a little bit differently since, and people continue to join the call, and I don't know how to monitor, Andy, how many people are on the call, but anyway. We've had about 30 right now, Bishop. Okay, how do you know that? Because at the very bottom, it says participants 30 at the bottom of the screen. Oh, I was wondering what that was for. I saw that before. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so I think uh, Andy's going to monitor the chat for us in terms of questions. Am I correct about that? Correct. Okay, so we're, we're going to be doing this. is going to be a little bit different. There's not going to be as many people. And of course, that could change as we go. So, Cammie, if you want to open us, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, um, so you guys are on this call. It's the local church's uh, financial health. Um, our, our bishop has said he would spend some time with us around a conversation of financial health for your churches. Um, and we also wanted to hear about what your challenges or successes have been um, in the past weeks and just to kind of get a pulse of what's going on and how can how we can partner and uh, be with you in, in all of this time. So as I uh, as we begin, I'm going to be the host. Um, I think the bishop's going to be mostly the one that's speaking. Um, but we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, write in the chat area some of your questions. And if we want to get a little bit more from that, we'll, uh, you know, ask you to unmute and then you can, um, you know, comment more if there's more uh, things to say. Let me open with these words uh, from Thomas Merton. And, and in the spirit of um, gratefulness for our God. To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything that he has given. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace, for it brings with it immense grace from him. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening, to new wonder, and to a praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. And that is what makes all the difference. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the God that, that we know, that walks with us, that gives us new life and breath and hope, and so in these times, Lord, we pray your presence be in our life, in our leadership. We pray that we will recognize that you are a God that gives us abundant life and provides everything. And so, Lord, as we walk in faith this day, may you bless us as colleagues together. May you walk in faith with our bishop and our leadership. And may you continue to bring new life and breathe new life into us. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Cammie. So uh, remember, there's a chat feature, and that chat feature is at the bottom of the screen, and you have to, and it's, um, I want to put it, uh, so there's one question already on the chat, and basically it's the way in which uh, you can ask a question, and we'll be following that as well, and that's, um, I want you to know that. Uh, if if you do speak uh, with a question, we come back to you. If you could, um, if you could make that an elevator question, and by that, you know what an elevator speech is, about 10 seconds, and so just, uh, we can follow up if we'll, we'll note who spoke and who told us something, and we can follow up. We won't do that today, but we'll have a way to follow up, uh, either with your superintendent or the Connection Resources Office or uh, some other way. So I want you to know that. So I just wanna, I wanna share the obvious, but just first of all, to um, so that we understand uh, that uh, we all are on the same page. Uh, Today, with the job numbers that came out, it just reminds us about how fragile the economy may be coming, and we, we really don't know the extent of that. Uh, and I'm not uh, I'm not a forecaster in terms of the economy, but um, six million claims, over six million claims, new job uh, unemployment claims, is uh, is alarming, and that begins to that'll sweep across the country in some ways. And we would be uh, remiss if I would be remiss if I did not admit or acknowledge that that will begin to affect members of your own churches about the loss or of jobs or laid off in, in some some former fashion. I, I 
you know, just speaking to you, uh, the last time I was on a plane was several, a few weeks ago, right before this was beginning to emerge and I was coming back from Nashville and I already could see both in the Nashville airport and the DFW airports that uh, people were beginning to sort of dial back their travel and people hear that. I don't know that they, uh, just, I mean, I think people have been traveling for business will discover this tool may be uh, almost as productive as traveling somewhere to do to do needed work and, and certainly the hospitality industry is a big driver in the Dallas Fort Worth area as we know because of the airport and so I can imagine that some of you have already had uh, if you've had clergy excuse me clergy if you've had uh, persons in your church that you know have been uh, laid off furloughed let go or any however we want to call it a job would you sort of raise your hand because of this See, it's about a third or maybe a half. And so this is, this is going to be challenging and, and uh, kind of thing. So uh, it's going to impact the church significantly. It'll impact your local church. It'll impact the conference. It'll impact the general church with any, uh, in, in ways that we don't know. And so one of the things that I'm very clear about as we move forward, that, uh, that anything that we may decide today may get changed tomorrow simply because the, the ground is going to be shifting under us all the time. And so um, one of the things that, uh, that we're going to seek to do is to be as nimble uh, as we can. And, um, I, you know, I also am a party to this on the general church level, since the president of the General Council on Finance Administration is something that we are closely following as well. The second thing I want to say to you is I'm very appreciative for your leadership, uh, your leadership as being a pastor. And I want to remind you in, the, in, the, in, uh, in that it. Uh, I want to remind you about what uh, we're ordained to, word, order, sacrament. And I think sometimes we get confused about what order is. And I had to do some correction about this even related to some, with some beginning people in licensing school and what didn't happen at licensing school. I'm, I want to be clear about that. But, but it happened in such a way that ordering is about, you know, making sure that these things happen, the printing of the bulletins, those kinds of things. That's not order. Order is this. Order is really about what it means to be, um, I would not want to call it a CEO because you're not running businesses, but I would want to see the person who's responsible, not only for setting the vision, the strategy of the church, but see how it's going to be funded and be able to alert, alert the leaders of the church in such a way that we have some challenges here and, and how are we then going to, um, how, how are we going to move through this? What are we going to do? What are some possible things we could do? And, so, and, the, and the earlier you do that, I think is very important. And I'll talk about that perhaps a little bit later. It's like, um, uh, there are any number of times in the last few years in the, in the conference that I'm thinking, I wish we'd have known this about four months earlier than we did, because the earlier we know, uh, it, we can be more helpful. And secondly, the earlier you let your leaders know what's going on, it can be helpful. And instead of thinking, oh, this is going to get better um, once we all get back to church, it will get better, but it may not get better fast enough or as well. So we just, let's please keep an eye on that. And, uh, and uh, I think it's important in terms of what it means to order the life of the church. Uh, when we get to the other side of this, uh, the other side is going to look very different it do, than it does now. Uh, let's leave the economic impact out. But um, in the way I hear some things, is the other side, there are pieces of the other side that might look better. Um, when, when I hear reports from some of you about the number of people who are online, now I need, I need to confess, I could have been one of those people who was online in one of your services, but you need to know I'm sort of passing through a lot of services sometimes on Sunday morning. I just think, I just want to see, you know, and what's going on and see, see what I can learn and pass it on. But I want to say is, is that, um, when you get to the other side, uh, I think we may all discover that everybody's going to have to have a significant online presence. Secondly, when we get to the other side, it's going to be, we're going to have to realize that we need to learn new ways to help people be generous. I'm going to talk about that later, but the other side is the work that we'll do together and you don't have to do alone. And, um, you know, one, the, one of the things I'm discovering is this, is there, significant numbers of gifted clergy in our annual conference that are doing remarkable things they never thought they were capable of. And, uh, and I, I, I want to do that, to tell you that. And then finally this, we're a connectional church and we're in this together. I don't want any one of you to feel like you're alone on an island. And uh, 
um, the one good thing about being United Methodist clergy is, is that you really have colleagues and you're in a covenantal relationship with your other colleagues. And I would simply say to you, um, this, this, if, if you need something, this could be a good time to call a colleague you trust who you don't speak to until you see them at an annual conference and just visit with them. Uh, I, 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 w- I will admit that I have um, four or five bishops that I'm in touch with regularly uh, and um, uh, just to see what they are thinking and what's going on. Now, we've all chosen to pursue things differently. We didn't come to what the desire to keep agreement, but it was a way to share something that, was, that, that were helpful. So I just want, I want to say that to you. Uh, so that's part of the thing. So I want to I want to talk about some of the challenges that we're hearing that you've had, and we were going to do this at the end, but we thought it might be helpful because it framed the conversation a little bit better. Um, and that is is that there's been conversations around the reducing of clergy salaries, and I won't, I want to tell you, you know, the finance committee cannot do that on their own. So if you if that needs to happen, uh, let's talk to your superintendent first before that gets out of the bag and how to how to do that. I know there may be some reduction in salaries and. Um, and we'll go through that, but I think that it really does call for a charge conference uh, to do that. I mean, these budgets are set, your salaries are set for the calendar year. We have to remind people of that. But I think there may be other ways around this other than reducing your salaries. I'll, I'll admit that some of the salaries, if they were reduced, uh, I mean, it, 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 it would be... Um, very detrimental to families in some ways. Uh, there are some of us, our salaries are reduced, that would not. Uh, somebody did write me that I should reduce my salary and the district superintendent's salaries. First of all, I don't set my salary, uh, the general church does. And secondly, I, we don't, I don't set the district superintendent's salaries, the, con- the conference does, but we are, and we'll, we'll talk about that more, but I don't want you to get up against, between a rock and a hard place on that. So if, if that is talk that's going on in your church, then we need to, we need to know about it before it gets farther out there. The second thing is, is the staff reductions. Now, Jody Smith, I believe on Tuesday, am I right, Cammie? Yeah, on Tuesday talked about reductions and furloughs and those things. So I'm not, the law is significantly different than what it was because of what the Congress passed and the president signed the other last week. So we need to, I don't, I don't I'm really not a party to all the information related to that, and I'm not going to be. So uh, I refer you back to our website on the uh, this stuff on the coronavirus, COVID-19, and I think that'd be more helpful to you. And if not, then call Jody or send her an email, and that could be helpful. Uh, less income due to online worship. I'm gonna address that a little bit. I know that's a problem. There's interesting things. I was, I've talked to some of our pastors who, are, who said that they had the best first quarter ever that March was unbelievably good while they were worshiping online. And so one of the things I want to do is talk about that and think about some ways, what were they doing that might be helpful to you? I do think when this is over, I hope that those people who have not had online giving or platforms and a way people to give on their websites will discover it is now time. It just, you mean, you can't wait for some uh, people in pew do not necessarily mean people are giving people are giving because they're dedicated to the mission committed to it. So we'll talk about that. And lastly, concerns about paying apportionments. I think it's pretty clear that since I've been the Bishop here almost eight years that I have not been heavy handed about apportionments at all with you. I've been somewhat concerned about those of you who did not pay and it was a surprise to us or some things we found out had been going on for three or four years and we just found out about it. That is the kind of stuff that makes me uh, more than disappointed. That's why I say tell us early rather than later. Look, we know this is going to affect financial outcomes in your churches and many of them. Do not use this as an excuse to say we're going to get a ride on this. Nobody's going to get a ride on anything. And by that I mean this. It's like we're going to tend to the whole mission of church. We're well aware that some people will do the best and do have the capacity they have in the church is this is what they're going to be able to do. And, and they will, and that's what they'll do. And that will, will, will work through that already. Uh, so let's not, um, that's not your biggest concern today. Your biggest concern is to make sure your staff gets paid and the operational costs go on. 
but don't look for any new ways to spend money. You know, if you get in a crunch, you don't look for another way to spend money. You look for a way to save some money or to, and, and another way to do some income. So let's, I, I, I want to say once again, I want to, uh, about the relief and assistance. Jody and I talked about this this morning. I want to refer you to that is that uh, about that webinar she did. And Andy, was that webinar videoed? Is it taped? Yes. And oh, Jody, there you are. The screen. I see you. It was. Jody, it's taped. Yep. Right. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So you can go on and it's on, on the site. You can do that. If you're having trouble with that, email uh, Jody and she can direct it to you. So that would be helpful. I, I do want to talk about budget cuts in some ways that I can't. Um, that, that we're looking at in terms of the annual conference. And I think this is helpful in terms of the apportionments. You know, we cannot, we cannot cut the budget for 2020. I mean, somebody said, go, go cut the budget. Well, uh, that, that authority belongs to the annual conference. And by the time the annual conference meets, we're going to be over six months in, we're not going to cut the budget. So there's no way to do it. What we can do is prepare a budget for the adoption of the next annual, annual conference for 2021. It will look somewhat different than the budget that we have now. How much, we don't know. But um, we are continuing to work on that. We have some things in place that will reduce that sum. I want to remind you that, the, um, that uh, there's, a, there's a reduction. Um, and to be honest, this is sort of a confusing piece. I don't want to get into it. There, there is proposed reduction for the quadrennial budget that begins on January 1, 2021, of, that would uh, mean about over nine hundred thousand dollars, am I correct, Jody? Of general church apportionments, which is a significant piece, and our budget's roughly between what twelve and a half million dollars. So that looks about eight percent of the budget, roughly, uh, that we can that we that that you will not see. We, we've considered some other anyway. So I've talked about the decrease for the overall North Texas budget, but the other thing we're doing in terms of that decrease is we're managing our spending down which means we're not spending money we don't have. We don't want to eat into any a lot of reserves. And it means there may be some new initiatives that we had hoped to do that we will not do. Let me, but there are things that we can do and continue to do that are not costly at all. So the other day, um, the racial, um, the racial uh, anti-racism team, uh, uh, Matt, is it the team or was it the team, Andy, basically? Yes, the uh, coordinating team for the racial justice initiative. Coordinating team for the racial justice met. We are able to do that on Zoom. This is an initiative that's not going to require a lot of money, but it is something we can still move forward on, simply because of, um, of volunteers that we have in place, clergy and laity who who've agreed to do that work, and and they can, and uh, they're able to meet on Zoom. Well, they, they could have all traveled to the conference office. We're not. We're trying to do as little travel as possible. Well, first of all, we're not supposed to, and that's one thing. But anyway, so we there's some things perhaps that we've done that we may scale back or may choose not to do that we can't do. These are my big concerns. My concerns are is that um, is that we continue to have campus ministry. I mean, my concerns are that we continue to do what we're doing in terms of missional outreach. My concerns are that we continue to uh, to fund health care uh, in the ways that we're supposed to uh, fund health care. But we we are one is a somewhat not somewhat we are healthy financially, but it doesn't mean that we're just going to go spend money that just to spend money. And we're looking at a lot of ways in which we can reduce cost and uh, we'll continue to do that. And uh, that's a topic of conversation that happens every week. So with all of that being said, we want to start addressing your questions. If you've got any, and there's some on the chat. There is one uh, Bishop from Mark Corazal. He's asking, are we, um, aren't we likely to see some of our small membership churches that can't afford go from full time, um, to uh, more part-time. So Mark, that may be possible. And the reason why I sort of like to get ahead of this is to help them find ways in which that doesn't happen. Now, if there's a significant job uh, problem, that's something we can't address. But I believe it's something we can address uh, in terms of generosity. And I want, to, I want to go back to what I said earlier. I hope when we get through this, that every church will decide that they need an online giving platform and help people understand that they don't give just when they come to the pew. 
So how is it you begin to communicate as a pastor about what it means to help people be generous in this very critical time in ministry? You're still working. You're not taking the week off and showing up on Sunday in front of a camera or an iPhone. So there's still ministry that's going on. There are other things that are being done in the community that you're helping fund and perhaps. So what is it that you need to do? How can you connect, for example, with your own lay people and, and just acknowledge, I'm continuing to give. The first thing to do is to be first person about your own giving. I'm continuing to give to Church of, of the uh, to First Church, wherever. I'm continuing to give and to be generous because the work of our Christ continues on and on, despite the difficulties that may be happening. So I'm going to ask you to be generous. Please, would you send a check that you normally would have given? Would you send it to this address? Would you do this? Would you do that? Or I think I know that the conference has said. Those of you who don't have platforms, people are not accustomed to mailing their check. Uh, they can, there's a way they can do that on the conference website and they can uh, share what church it is go to, goes to and we're doing that. And some people have already started giving to the conference uh, that we will then send to the local church that they designate. But I think that you have to start communicating about this now and you can't wait till we all get back. Because if I've been if I've been accustomed to giving a thousand dollars a month, um, I would probably still give that thousand dollars. I would give that thousand dollars during March. Uh, we get, we give. I want that's. I'm just pulled out of thin air. By the way, uh, we do. Then you know how how do I how do I give it since I'm not at church? How do I give it? I think sometimes people don't know. When I was a pastor of a church, 60% of our income came online and by mail. I want to say it again, 60% of our income. Today, the church I, that I was serving when I was elected bishop, the pastor who's one of my dear friends reported to me, he said, I'm, and that, look, this is a joke. And I'm, I think a little humor. Philip Rhodes told me, he said, Mike, I'm thinking about closing the sanctuary. Our worship attendance has skyrocketed through the roof. So that's one thing. I mean, it's like four or 500 more. Now, who knows how people are counted in that, but that's an interesting note. And then he said, we've had the best first quarter we've had in years financially. So what I'm saying is, is that why don't you develop those platforms now, start communicating them, send a letter, send an email to everybody in your church and say, this is a critical moment in the life of our church. I'm continuing to give, would you give, even though you're not present? I wanna share with you my concern about giving in the United Methodist Church among Christians, period. I shouldn't, I'm, I can only talk about the United Methodist Church. Is they feel like I only give when I come. Now to me, that seems like a transaction. I'm gonna pay you for my seat at this show and it should be good. And if it's not good, I'm not gonna give as much next week when I show up. So I think the, what we're seeing here is a lack of understanding about generosity and uh, giving that I hope you find your own voice about how to ask. Now look, I would not say watch online, but be sure and drop by the church and give us your money. I mean, we had somebody who was almost that bad uh, and it's not, that's not a way to do it. I would not, uh, I would not tie those two together. I would just say, I want to talk to you about a challenge we have. We all have challenges, but this is the challenge that your community of faith has right now. And uh, write in a pastoral voice, not a demanding voice, share your own give, giving. I mean, I think I always told people when they wanted to know what I, you know, what my salary was. I said, well, I'll tell you what I give. And I told them what I give. And they said, well, I want to know what your salary is. I said, you can, you can figure it out if you're smart. Well, I don't, what do you mean? I said, well, multiply it by 10. And that's how you, anyway, that's how I get it. But anyway, I think, I think you ought to be forthcoming about your own giving, about the challenges there are, what, what you've been doing, what the church is doing in this crisis. I mean, things don't come to a stop. You may not make an on-call visit in the hospital, but I hope you're at least phoning the family and keeping up with what's going on. So let's be honest, it's not just your salary, it's just the ongoing work of the church because some of you have loans and things of that nature. So if you need more help, I think Horizons has been 
uh, we put in all the Horizons email yes. things on the site. Mm -hmm. So emails from Horizons on the coronavirus side, and y'all we're throwing stuff up there all the time. So just check on it every day, and I think that's helpful. But this is a good time to start, you know, negotiating or navigating a new way of asking or encouraging people to be generous, and I hope you'll do that. But remember, they're not interested in your bills. They're interested in the cause of Christ. So that's just set this up, not as a fundraising for a nonprofit, but as, a, as the way in which you share about what it means to be faithful, and that is to be a generous giver. So, okay, what's the next question? So um, Nick McCray has a question about commissioning and when uh, commissionees start, uh, if they are appointed. And um, I just want to, I think I can address that by just saying that all the commissionees are going to be getting a letter um, explaining how that process is. Do you want to say more about that, Bishop? So, we've been, so the General Board of Higher Education Ministry, West Path and GCFA have all been pretty clear about this, is that the appointments, no matter when you go or when annual conference is held, will take effect on July 1. And so those people who are, who are we're going to ordain and commission people. And so... Uh, Nick, don't worry. Okay. There's a couple other questions I think that Jody um, ca can respond to that have to do with um, if there's how quickly funds get to uh, churches and things like that. Um, and I think there's also a question about how to help people get um, the um, the CARES uh, possible loan for the, the protection, Payroll Protection Act. And I believe that's all that information is on the website. Is that correct, Jody? That is correct. Um, and I'm updating it right now. Uh, I had an, a link on there for an EIDL plan with SBL. We're replacing that with your Paycheck Protection Program. Those links or the uh, eligibility for the loans is supposed to go live tomorrow. I encourage you to go ahead and contact your banker. Uh, if you have a good relationship with your banker, uh, that'll get you in the queue much, much faster. And you'll be able to use this new link to, to gather your documents. And I am providing updates as to what you need to do to prepare. Uh, this is a rapidly changing um, dynamic. Uh, for what you're going to have to have. One of the expectations is that you have uh, tax returns and you won't have those. So, so we're working on that. And I have to get off to attend another workshop on how best to do this. So I'm going to say goodbye. Please send me any uh, questions using the link on the website. And, and I will be responding to those with an FAQ page. Bye. Thanks. So, so one of the challenges about that law is the fact is they're still writing regulations to it. You know, Congress passes it in the regulations and this, Jody shared with me, this has changed day, this is changing daily and this is why it's so hard to pinpoint what's going on. Uh, I want to go back. Andy did write, um, uh, I think Andy had this idea or somebody did about reducing it. If you feel called to do so as a good leader to reduce your salary. Simply give back to the church a portion of salary without officially changing the salary. Doing so will make it easier to adjust on the other side of the crisis, return the salary to its pre-pandemic level. Good idea. Okay, what else do we have here? And then I think just to add to that, Bishop, uh, Deborah put a note about um, that helps us not have to change pension numbers and things like that. So just to, just make sure you are aware of that. Um, Kim Poor is asking the question, do we have direction about what we, uh, what would be acceptable alternatives to convening the congregation for a vote if the congregation wants to approve an application for CARES? Convening. Does the congregation have to do that? This is not, this, uh, Kim, why don't you follow up with Jody to clarify that? Um, I can offer one. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one or two information um, about that briefly. So there's conversation about how to host, uh, you know, virt virtual meetings that, uh, like of trustees that would be legally, that would stand up legally. And uh, I would, if you want to follow up with me, I can get the finer points. But basically, like in a Zoom call, if people can be noted as present as individuals, if they have the opportunity 
to comment and ask questions and those questions be responded to. And if, and if there's a way to determine who's voting for what, then that meets the standard for a legally, you know, a legally binding uh, meeting. And so if you need to gather your church council for the approval of something, doing so by Zoom with those kinds of criteria um, meets that standard. That's at least the conversations I've been a part of. That's what we've been talking about. We Bishop also is. said yesterday, and excuse me, we also said yesterday in our cabinet meeting that if you are talking about taking a loan that's less than 25% of the value of your facilities, it can be done by the church council and doesn't have to have a charge conference. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deborah. All right, there's a question from Laura Eccles Richter. Uh, we're hearing of more and more of our members who are losing their jobs. What churches have effective job ne networking groups that we can learn from? Does um, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm aware of one at University Park, United Methodist Church, and people come regionally uh, to that, but I bet they're not meeting right now. So someone email them. I'm aware of, of one resource, um, and this will uh, hopefully bring a smile to your face. So there's an organization that's called Get Shift Done. That's S-H-I-F-T, Get Shift Done. And uh, the goal of this organization is to pair uh, out of work people from the hospitality industry with nonprofits. And, um, the, and the way it works, the nonprofit doesn't pay for that person's salary the original employer does, or perhaps maybe through the CARES Act, their um, salaries are paid. But that's an organization that's looking to find ways to put out of work people uh, to work for good, so that you might check that out. Um, Andy, are you seeing any other questions that could be addressed? Nick, I saw something else you said. Uh, hey, I promise you're going to be okay. Just everybody relax here on the, on the appointments problems. So I see uh, there's a question from Evan Jones about will churches be required to abide by the Book of Discipline requirements to have a 10-day waiting period between announcing a charge conference for a vote for one of these purposes, I assume, and then holding it. Deborah, where are you? Did Deborah leave us? I'm right here. I didn't. Was there a question for me? No. I just punted. I it. think we have to follow the book of discipline, no matter if we if we're so. sheltering or not. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The question has to do with following the book of discipline. Do they need to have a 10 day notice before they have a, a charge conference? You know, we ought to be careful about what, what we need a charge conference for, for one thing. Don't you think, Deborah? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you should call your district superintendent and we should figure this out um, situation by situation. That's a good thing. Part of my concern about just blanket saying that, and I mean, I don't want to not do what the Book of Discipline says, but what I'm hearing is if you're going to apply for these loans, get it ready tomorrow or as close to tomorrow as possible because the funds are going to run out. And so us getting real sticky about some of our, you know, particulars and missing out on these funds would, I, I think that could be worse, you know, and I would assume there's, uh, anyway, I'm speaking off the cuff was just dangerous in this kind of situation. So mm -hmm. call one of us if you're thinking about it. Hey, Jan, I think Jan's got a deal about how do we help small local churches, those without staff apply for this. And so I would, I, I refer you to Jody on that. So I, that'd be the best way to do it. Okay. Just to uh, piggyback on what Deborah said about uh, being expeditious about applying for, you know, PPE loans uh, through the CARES Act, that kind of thing. Uh, I was just on a call uh, with the board of one of our uh, nonprofits, and um, they shared something that I thought could be helpful and wise for us, and that is that uh, there are a lot of questions out there about 
um, what the requirements will turn out to be in order to have that loan forgiven and turn into a grant. Um, but they're not delaying applying anyway. They're applying as quickly as they can. And then um, they'll just hold, if they are given a loan, they'll just hold it in escrow until they're sure that the ways they plan to use it will meet the standards to have it be forgiven. Um, and if, if for whatever reason they learn that uh, they couldn't use the, the funds in a way that would be forgiven, then they'll just hold the money and give it back. But uh, as Deborah said, there's a limited amount of money that will be given. And so um, organizations are trying to reserve their spot early in the line. And so we'd probably be wise to do the same thing. All right, on the, just Bishop, on um, our agenda, we were going to be asking the question, um, what are the challenges the clergy are facing and also what are they learning? So we'd so like to know. That's an open mic time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Open mic to everyone, not this open mic, but what are you learning and what are the challenges? You can unmute in the lower left corner. So I feel like Marcus, um, I feel like one of our challenges is the average age over seventy. Um, some folks. Uh, whoa! I don't know who else is unmuted there, but. That was not my house. Sorry about that, though. <laughs> yeah, you can't all hear me all right. Yeah, so uh, we've got this average age of over 70, and uh, innovation is great, but I'm finding most of what I'm doing is more pastoral care, even with how we prepare worship online, uh, how we talk about giving, how we talk about all these things. I mean, sure, there's innovation conversation, but so much more of it is staying connected with people. And even low tech stuff like our phone calls or uh, even some kind of sending notes and stuff is making as much of a difference for people. Even just an email from me is making as much of a difference as even trying to explain what a Zoom call is or Facebook or whatever. So I just say that as an encouragement to like all the pressure we're feeling to have all the answers and to do so much that even just connection uh, in any form has made such a difference for my folks uh in the midst of trying to relearn how to do ministry in the midst of this season you can you can visit house to house as we're as we're asked to do pretty quickly just keep picking up the phone i mean you, you can make more visits on the phone than you could driving from house to house so it's a great thing thanks people are looking for authenticity they don't expect wows out youtube or zoom calls for worship Okay, are there other questions? Uh, this is what are you facing? Uh, Bishop, I see a couple. Okay. Um, and uh, one is from, uh, from Nick McRae. For the past several months, our church had been looking into selling a portion of our unused real estate. Is there someone at the conference level we could talk to for advice on how this pandemic may affect that sale process, whether to proceed now or wait, et cetera? Call your district superintendent. I mean, so because of how that happens and whether you, I mean, man, I'd hate to get in buying and selling just right now. I mean, I might want to buy here in a few weeks, but I, I, I'm not going to give any real estate advice, but I wouldn't be heading out doing anything rash to raise money by selling land. I don't think. We also have Tom Christian who is available to us to help help with some resourcing. That's true. I forget him. That's, that's we use Tom a lot for that. Other questions? So Michael Moore asked a question, can a congregation reconfigure how staffs at church, that is use lay ministers more in partnership with reduced professional staff? Well, it depends, you know, you got to remember uh, every elder has a claim on an appointment. So you can, so a congregation can't just reduce that. Uh, and oh, we're going to hire a bunch of lay people. Um, anyway, but I don't talk to your DS. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, and in some of our churches, we got to remember, we do have a lot of, 
we have some churches that got a lot of uh, cl clergy on staff, but we have a lot of churches that have just a solo pastor with some lay people and how, how that's managed and how you deal with the reduction of staff related that again, uh, I think it's something that the Jody addressed yesterday and I'd encourage you to go to the site or to call her about significant HR issues because I, I do think this has changed how all that happens. Um, Michael, I, I see that piece. Um, uh, we're not going to put a, anyway, I'm not, once you give a call to, to your superintendent, I think that he, uh, he could be more helpful than I could on this call about that to get at what the particulars are. Okay. So the question is, what challenges are you facing and uh, what are you learning? Any other input? Kind of things you guys want to offer? Anything want to, anyone, anyone want to offer? Say the, the challenges that we have of sharing space with family members, each having different jobs to do in the household and trying to find the space to do it and uh, giving space uh, and breathing as we share that. Okay, thanks, Wally. Any other challenges? Yeah, I may offer one other challenge that I feel like right now. I think particularly when we think of like our year-end reports and uh, marks of fruitfulness, sometimes it can get in the narrative, even unintentionally so, about uh, how much we do. And that being some signifier of like how much we're worth as pastors. <laughs> and I, I'm guessing I'm not alone in feeling that struggle right now of like, oh, I can't do as much or I can't be as many places or whatever. And so just trying to recalibrate like in that internal work of, you know, my worth as a pastor, uh, how much I'm accomplishing and getting done and what's enough and how we gauge, you know, what's enough connection in a given day or a given week, what's enough work in a given day or week right now. And I think that's just unknown right now, but I think just to name that challenge is uh, important right now. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I respond to this? Um, you know, I have to admit it's not, I never imagined these these last six weeks would be like what they are, and I I I, it, I don't want to use well I'll just put it in sort of real understandable English. I feel your pain on this, and so uh, it's it's not how I had planned uh, these several weeks uh, through Lent. And I think by the way I think we're looking at even beyond Easter on on all this and what was going to happen. And I, I told Joan last night when I came in, she goes, you look awful. And I said, well, that's a thank you very much. I mean, and then she goes, well, how are you feeling? And I go, I'm just pooped. I'm just tired. And I'm not doing what you're doing. I think what you're doing is even more tiring than what I do. I mean, I, I know that. And what I'm saying is, is that, and just remember, I, we've got to remember, we cannot define our worth by what we get accomplished on our to-do list for the day, ever. Unless we're just not paying attention to time or frivoling away time, but it's, it's not about the to-do list. It's about being authentically you and living the God's gifts and graces that God has for you and, and doing those and, and, and using those in any way possible during the day, just everything's different. And so I don't want anybody to think this is about, you know, a, a judgment or you need to internalize that at all because we are all pedaling in the same direction as fast as we can. I mean, I, I, I think that we are and that, uh, and that we just, we know that we, uh, that we're in this together. And, but more importantly, the most important part of that each and you have, each of you has the most important partner is really our creator. We just have to remember that. And God made you and called you good yeah. done. So don't worry about not getting anything done. But don't spend all your time writing songs, Marcus. Get something, do get something done. I just want to say that to you, okay? Just, just want you to know that I'm, you, once you're on Facebook, I'm a party to your life. <laughs> That's just, you know, you've invited me into your home and everything else. Okay. Um, we at uh, The Woods, uh, we have some folks who are beginning to pressure us to do parking lot worship especially with all of the conversation yesterday and even on a Zoom call with the Grand Prairie Police Chief uh, who was asked that and sent notes clarifying, yes, we can do that if people stay in their cars and yes, we can do drive-by communion 
if the person handing it through the window has on gloves and a mask, and I'm so resistant to doing any of that. Um, I want us to just maintain our, our streaming worship. Um, and I'm getting pushback because they're like, well, Matthew Rhodes is doing that, and this place is doing that, and it doesn't feel safe. And I, we don't even have the technology to really broadcast to the parking lot well. So um, any words of <laughs> encouragement on holding that line? Yeah, and I know we were talking about finances, but if it gets into other stuff, we'll do that for a little while. So I'm fine with this. Okay. Okay. The question. One is, as I said last night, and it's something I think uh, we're in the midst of preparing something today that goes out, no drive-by communion. Just no. Right. Just right. no. And if Thank they, you for that. <laughs> just blame it all on me. Okay. Thank you for that. You know, I mean, I, I, well, don't blame me. Just say, our bishop's been very clear in terms of how he understands the order and he's doing right. that. He wants to make sure that we don't infect anybody and we don't, we don't know that that's a given, but I got to tell you, no to drive by. Computer. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, when I go get groceries that I've ordered to pick up, I'm not allowed to get out of the car. I'm not, a, I, I can roll down the window. They stand six feet away. There's no way they can reach with gloves in there. They tell me to open the trunk. They put them there and I drive off. So no drive by communion. Thank you. <laughs> Not Mardi Gras when we're throwing beads off floats, and this is the way it's getting to sound like to me. No, I, so, in terms of the sacredness of this meal, of this Holy Communion, we're not going to loosen the restrictions about online for eight days, Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday, but then we're going to go back. No online communion, and that's why we did the agape feast. So, no to that. I got to tell you, I, if you get in the parking lot uh, and try to do that with less than good equipment, I don't know that that's gonna work that much. And I gotta tell you, I, I know who Methodists are. For, for people to get to a parking lot and think they're gonna stay in their car when their best friend is one row up and not get out to sort of do some talking and hugging is just, that's what's gonna happen. Let's stay to what we are. And I know other people are doing some things. I said no to a football stadium yesterday. And so it's just easier. We're all going to do it alike. In fact, one group of 10 wanted to get together and, and gather in a sanctuary. And to be honest, they could, have, they could have had social distancing, whatever you call it. But the problem is, is that the capacity for people to violate space, I do not want to get permission to. So no, it's just the easiest way. That way we don't have to, I don't have to remember who we did, who, who we said could do what which is a problem. That may seem harsh, but I think we ought to all use the same stuff. Okay, Chris Yost. Um, we have a significant family and friends up in Washington State and the Governor Jay Inslee last week uh, put out a word to people who are getting antsy. He said, all of us know a healthcare professional, a nurse, a doctor, take their picture, print it and put it on your steering wheel and ask yourself the question, is what I'm about to do worth killing the, this person? And if drive-through communion or well, drive-in whatever is worth killing that person, then fine, go do it. Obviously, it's not. But that's how desperate they've had to get to convey how critical it is that people stay home. You get in a fender bender on your way to parking lot church. Guess what? Now the whole healthcare system has had to respond. That's how that stuff gets passed. Anyway, that was very stark. And our friends, when they told us that this a couple of days ago, they said, you know, have y'all heard this yet? And we were like, no. So I'm just passing it on to you all. That's how critical it is right now. Okay, two things in response. First of all, I think that uh, the article that, that Chris had written about his time on a submarine appeared on the news in the newsletter yesterday. Am I correct? Hey, that is a perfect, you know, Chris, thank you for sharing that. And the second thing is, is, the state of Washington is one of the hard, first hit, and they're now uh, getting close to bending the curve. And so everybody doing what we're asked to do. Now, I know the governor has sort of given this deal about religious services. I, you know, I've said from the get-go that our, the way in which we're going to decide about what we do is through the Dallas County judge, who I think is on top of this and was the first, one of the first in the state to sort of start shutting things down. And the, and the second is, is the CDC. Um, I, 
my motive, is, my motive, and I think the church's motive is to be as keep people healthy so they don't suffer. And that that's that's my overarching goal. And it's interesting to me. I just I want to. This may sound political to you, but people who say they're pro life, I'm ready for them to prove it. That was a prophetic word. And pro life means the health of children, the health of seniors, the health of healthcare workers. We're going to do all we can to protect them. Okay. Is there another question or anything else? Bishop, I'm wondering if, if they can respond to the question, what are they doing to help people be generous? Yeah, I'd like to hear that. What are you doing to help people be generous? Somebody's got their um, not muted. Raise your hand and tell us. Okay, Nick. Uh, this is something that we've done that seemed to be uh, pretty effective is uh, we've, because um, we've had like a phone app you could use all along. But anyway, when we send out our order of worship for the week, we just include in an email, just include a link under the offertory section to the place to, to um, where people can give online. It seems like a pretty simple little thing, but it has seemed to be very effective and something we had never done before. So if I'm watching your worship service, I want to get this straight. I can click on that link and give. Yes, but it's a, well, yeah, we always, uh, at the beginning, we invite people to check their email and pull up the order of worship, which is, uh, which has been emailed to them previously. And as they're following along with the liturgy and stuff, when we get down to the offertory section and Frank or whoever it is says, um, you know, if you, if you look in your order of, on your order of worship, you'll see, and you'll see the link there, you click on it and you can give from that. So that's what we've been doing. You know, uh, I've, no, I've known, uh, my mother tells about Baptist churches in her childhood who would lock the doors until they received enough offerings. And you could say, we'll continue the worship if all of, after everybody's given. I, I don't recommend that, but I'm just saying that if there's a link there, it makes it so much easier for me to respond, though, and that's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> what are some other things that people are doing? It's not directly with worship, but we uh, had a really good year reestablishing our preschool this year and then having to cut it short. Um, we were very fearful about what that might do to our enrollment and being able to pay for what we needed to for the teachers. And uh, our preschool, they put together an, a, an online version. So all of the teachers are doing Facebook Live on a schedule from their homes and the preschool families are loving it. They're very engaged and they're all excited about coming back. Um, and I actually, I did uh, leave my house yesterday to deliver curriculum packets to all 50 households uh, from Fort Worth to uh, Midlothian. And that's why I missed the love feast last night. But uh, in delivering those with safe distancing, I had several families express their gratitude and families ask about our online Easter worship. And so um, hopefully we'll, we'll get generosity from them in coming back and in uh, being more involved in the congregation. So um, I'm, I'm excited about that. Good work, Kim. Thank you. That's great. Anyone else? Okay, so um, we're close to 11.30, so what I want to say is, is we're also um, uh, looking at developing a team of people who can be helpful to you. Um, it's not a large team, uh, but uh, we're, we're gonna start making calls out those. I've identified some of them as, hey, can you be helpful in terms of just some, some coaching and and by coaching, I mean some content about what to do and those kinds of things who are, who are well versed about uh, about issues related to stewardship and giving, uh, faithful giving. So we're gonna be, we'll be we'll be doing that, and I, I want you to putting that group together. Okay. Does anyone else? Andy, you got do, Andy? Do you have anything? I would just note several folks are responding to the question about what they're doing in the chat. So yeah. if you're not monitoring that, folks who are a part, you might uh, see what people are sharing there as well. 
I saw some of that. Is there a way we can gather that and send them out to who was on this call? Yes, uh, I guess, Cammie, if you're the host, just be sure to save the chat before you leave the meeting and we can uh, email that to everybody. I don't know who the host is. Uh, we're the host and Tracy Everson can do that for us, I believe. So yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Tracy, can you do that for us? Yes, sir. You are great. Thank you. Lot, lots of good ideas on that so chat. I can find this on the chat. So we'll get that. And we and can you save the participants too, Tracy? Is that a possibility? Well, you know. I'll see what I can do to screenshot everybody. I don't know what that is. Oh, hey, I just changed the screen and there's so many more of you out there than I saw on my screen. Each of us could go into the chat and simply cut and paste, you know, highlight all, copy and paste it into a Word document if you've got a second to do that. Okay. Okay, we're getting into technical stuff, which is beyond my yeah, levels of capacity and capability. That's as technical as I get. You know what? That's a lot more technical than I'm going to get today. I want to thank you all. Uh, again, if you have any questions, call your su district superintendent. They know how to reach. Uh, email Jody. Um, and we, we, want to, we want to be as helpful as we can, and we can't give all the, all the ideas. And if, if there's anything that you think, I need some help with this, we'll be glad to do that. So um, anything else? Anybody want to say anything? Also, please use that question button that's on the COVID page on ntcumc.org because that's what Jody's hoping she can use to find out what questions people have and then post answers for everybody. Thanks, Deborah. I'll just add, um, just from listening to several people giving their own witness, that several folks have found that their lay people are a wealth of knowledge around what to do in some of these times of crisis. And that um, remember, we're not we're a United Methodist Church, so we are uh, we empower the laity, we walk with the laity, they give us um, support um, as well, and they also are very knowledgeable. So to honor them by uh, being in conversation with them and um, letting them know uh, how much you value them, uh, I think is a gift to all of us. <laughs> and so uh, I would just add that to the mix. Right. And I want to remind you, if your church is in financial difficulty, I'm not talking about it, but financial difficulty, would you call your district superintendent or send him or her an email detailing what that difficulty is? And as we gather those responses, they can be helpful about how we help move through this period of time. So I want you to know that. Uh, I, I want to thank each one of you for being on the call. And it turns out that we had about 50 participants and uh, I'm grateful for each one of you and what you're doing. I don't, I have to admit uh, that I, I have so much admiration and respect for you, and I did even before this, but uh, it keeps, uh, it, it has grown significantly, and it was, it was in pretty good shape beforehand, but thank you for, for what you're doing, and I know this is difficult work, but uh, we want to resource you in all the ways that we can. Please know that every day that uh, when I rise in the morning, I pray for the clergy of the North Texas Conference. I do it as a group. And uh, I think it's important for you to know that my prayers have changed significantly about what I pray for. And one is, is I pray that you stay well. And you stay well by, you know, observing good boundaries, six feet, social distance, and those kinds of things. Uh, and that you wash your hands and that you do everything possible to, um, to take care of yourself or to care for yourself and as well as those who are around you. So, so God bless you on everything you do. And, uh, um, for that, I think I'm going to close with a prayer. I don't see anything else that we need to do. There's nothing on the chat that I think to respond to at this point. Uh, but anyway, those who we have the list of everything, we'll send that out to you at, at some time soon. Let us pray. Holy God, during this time, it just seems as if every day is a new day, but the new day does not mean that there's always excellent news that we hear, but oh God, we know that somehow in the midst of all that, you're ever present. Let us never forget, oh God, that you continually uh, inhabit the places where we are, that you are already present there, uh, uh, even when we do not sense that or know that. Just being with these uh, 50 plus clergy today, 
on a call that reminds me about the strength of the church and the gifts and graces you have given to uh, the United Methodist Church in the North Texas area. For that, I'm deeply grateful. As we go our separate ways and as we do things uh, this day to uh, further the work that you have called us to do, we know again that we go with your guiding spirit. Bless each and every one. And oh God, we pray for those who are caring for those who are suffering, whether it's the coronavirus or some other malady at this time, because we know that the front line, the people in the most danger right now, are those people who are tending to people we know, caring for those who are ill, and frankly, risking their own lives. God, how do we repay them? We pray for them. In your name, amen. Have a good night. I mean, have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you all.